The American Civil Liberties Union has a 97-year history of impact litigation, using singular lawsuits at specific points of injustice to impact broad populations. In recent years, lobbying and grassroots mobilization have amplified this targeted political pressure. It is the combination of tactics and decades of history that have put the ACLU at the forefront of resistance in this era of Trump. To discuss their work, Bridget Slipka joins us from ACLU's DC division. Bridget joined the ACLU DC as the Director of Philanthropy in October 2014. She had previously raised funds for the Smithsonian Institution, California Institute of the Arts, and Yale University. Bridget was the proprietor of a popular philanthropy blog from 2008 to 2014, where she wrote extensively on the theory and practice of giving. She has served on the board of GiveWell since 2013. Bridget, please come to the stage. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. This is a lot more people here to hear about the ACLU than I thought that there might be. Um, so as mentioned, um, I'm Bridget Slipka, and I come to this conversation with a very particular lens. Um, I work at the ACLU. I'm the director of philanthropy there. But I've also been on the board of GiveWell for four years now. Um, and in my career as a fundraiser, I have consistently thought about how my own personal giving can have an impact and how my professional career can have an impact in these areas where there is the greatest um, human suffering. So is those things together um, that fuel my lens into the um, <clears throat> conversation we're going to have today. Now, I know I've talked to a lot of folks who are, for example, from the Center of Effective Altruism. This is very US policy focused. I'm going to get into a lot of specifics that may or may not be relevant, but hopefully um, the broader picture will be able to be seen and we can use the ACLU's experience um, to help guide what effective altruism is thinking about as they're talking about changing policy. Okay. <clears throat> This is a very uh, big overview of the ACLU. We're 97 years old. Um, one of our first predominant cases was in 1925, when the ACLU argued that a public school teacher should be able to have a curriculum that was based on science, not religion. This was separation of church and state. In 1933, the ACLU brought one of the first predominant freedom of speech cases. Um, this was the case against the ban of James Joyce's Ulysses. It had been banned based on obscenity. In 1963, um, this case is now, Gideon is now one of the fundamental cases of uh, US law. And in it, the Supreme Court said that everyone has the right to an attorney, even if you can't afford it. So if you've seen Law and Order and you've heard the bit where they say you have a right to an attorney, even, and if you can't afford one, the court will provide one for you, that was the ACLU. That was their case. 66, um, the ACLU brought a case to the Supreme Court that um, was Griswold, which at that time overturned a ban on birth control for married women, because that was a thing. Um, <clears throat> and that laid out the framework for um, the right to privacy when it comes to healthcare decisions. And that, in turn, was then the foundation for Roe versus Wade um, a few years later, which allowed American women the option of legal abortion. It was the ACLU um, that brought the case Loving v. Virginia. That's what overturned the ban on interracial marriage. Not quite 50 years later, the ACLU brought the case um, Oberschfell, which overturned bans on same-sex marriage. So we have a lot of issues <laughs> that we work with at the ACLU. Um, core issues at the top are what we call First Amendment issues, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from religion, freedom of press, um, the ability to congregate with uh, the right to protest. We also believe that the government is very much um, for the people, by the people, of the people. 
And so that means the people who determine the policy need to have equal access to represent the, uh, excuse me, to vote for their representatives who then determine that policy. So voting rights are an enormous aspect of the ACLU's work. The history of America, the history of this land has had um, repeated instances of discrimination against people for reasons of race, or gender, or country of origin, of religion, of sexual orientation, and this fight against anti-discrimination is also something that ACLU predominantly works on. Um, the other piece that is perhaps of particular interest to the effective altruism community is our work on criminal justice reform. And we very much are focused on the idea of due process. So if you are detained, first off, you have to be told what you're charged with. And then you have a chance to mount a defense. And only after that can a judge or a jury of your peers convict you. And so that idea of due process um, is fundamental to criminal justice in America. Meanwhile, um, all right, so, this, so the ACLU, what we do is coordinate with a lot of people and we draw a bunch of Venn diagrams. <laughs> so I just wanna show this is effective altruism causes. These are some things that you may have been talking about in the conference up until now. Extreme poverty, obviously um, animal suffering, scientific research, the global catastrophic risks. But what I uh, wanna draw your attention to is criminal justice reform and immigrants' rights, and where um, that's where the effective altruism community and the ACLU issues intersect. So I'm gonna talk about how the ACLU changes policy specifically here. Okay. How to impact policy. Okay, so we have um, a multi-pronged approach. First is litigation. We sue people a lot. We have sued every single president um, since the ACLU was founded. <laughs> I did not think that would be where the applause line was, but okay. Um, I'm sure we'll get back to what uh, prompted that specifically. Um, <clears throat> also, we lobby legislators. And finally, what I wanna focus on um, right here is this piece of public engagement. So it's, we work through the courts and we work through legislatures, but again, the government is for, of, and by the people, and so that rests on a foundation of public will. I'm gonna show you this slide. So here, um, this is a slide of public opinion on same-sex marriage. The light green line is people that thought same-sex marriage should be illegal, and the dark green line is uh, people that thought same-sex marriage should be legal. So in 96, which is when this chart starts, that's when the Defense of Marriage Act was passed in Congress. In 97, um, 27 states had passed laws that banned same-sex marriage but the ACLU and activists and our coalition partners were in the streets and talking to people and knocking on doors and making the case that LGBT people deserve the same rights as people who are heterosexual. And so um, year by year, there would be another state that would pass another same-sex ban and another same-sex ban, yet public opinion continued to creep up until we get to 2003 and here in the state of Massachusetts, um, the, they passed the first law legalizing same-sex marriage. Hey, this is good. <laughs> I'll clap for that. Okay. And meanwhile, continually, public opinion is ticking more and more in their favor, yet other states are still passing laws against same-sex marriage. Then in 2008, Connecticut. Uh, they pass a law allowing same-sex marriage. In California, they passed a ballot initiative banning it. And I was in California at the time, and it was so disheartening. Um, but we kept working with activists and 
moving the public opinion in a way that in 2009, Iowa and Vermont, they allowed same-sex marriage. In 2010, it was New Hampshire. In 2011, it was New York. In 2012, Washington and Maine, which had previously banned same-sex marriage, then passed it. So by the time we got to 2014, there were 36 states that had allowed for same-sex marriage. In 2015, that was when um, the Obersfeld case came down and the Supreme Court granted same-sex marriage nationwide. And Justice Kennedy's decision was groundbreaking. But it's so important to see it rested on this foundation of public will. Right. So as much as we work through the courts and as much as we work through legislation, we also work to change people's hearts and minds. OK, so all those, those three pieces together, I'm going to look at criminal justice and at immigration reform. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to litigation, the ACLU has a lot of cases in regards to criminal justice. Um, three cases that we have going on right at the moment. There is a class action lawsuit in Milwaukee against the police practices there. We have a class action lawsuit in Missouri. Um, uh, one of the first slides previously, I mentioned Gideon, which was the case that said that people have the right to an attorney even if they can't pay. So we're suing because in Missouri, even though that's what the Supreme Court said um, a, citizen's, a citizen's right is, in Missouri, they're not giving these people access to an attorney. So what we're seeing is um, a poor person is detained, and they could have the opportunity to get out on bail, but they don't have access to the legal counsel that could advise them how to do that, so they stay detained. And then they take a plea bargain, and they plead guilty to, um, to a crime for which the state doesn't have evidence, but that person just wants to get out of jail, right? They just want to be free. And so essentially what this is doing is criminalizing one's economic status. This is saying if you're poor, you'll be incarcerated. And one of my colleagues um, added up all of the uh, collateral consequences of incarceration once you leave, and it was in the thousands when they went through all the states. I mean, hugely very much in terms of um, how you can get a job or how you can get housing. All of those things, once you have a record, you're stuck. And there are so many ways that then you cannot live a full life, I guess, in America um, because of your record through the criminal justice system. So that's litigation. Um, I'm gonna pop down to public engagement um, and just say I know that this is something that uh, communities of color knew, that there were massive problems um, with the criminal justice system. They knew this for decades, centuries. But in recent years, there have been some very high profile moments that have put this conversation in the mainstream media. We had um, the death of Trayvon Martin and the launch of Black Lives Matter, the death of um, Mike Brown in Ferguson or Eric Gardner in New York. Um, this particular picture is at a protest that the ACLU documented in DC. Um, <clears throat> there was a man whose name is, was Terrence Sterling. He was shot and killed by a police officer. He was unarmed. Part of this conversation has been, when it comes to police practices, has been trying to build transparency and accountability in how law enforcement interacts with the community. And in DC, we had worked for a long time to try to get um, body cameras, oh, excuse me, body cameras um, worn by all the police officers and the ACLU specifically worked very hard on um, putting the policy in place behind that so that it kept the right to privacy for, for example, a domestic violence victim or an innocent person on the street. Um, that was implemented, the hardware was passed out to the uh, police officers. And in the case of Terrence Sterling, the police officer forgot to turn his camera on. And so did his partner. 
And so this gentleman here who knew Terrence is holding a sign that says, why were the body cams turned off? Because we have seen that even if you try to implement the tools of transparency, if you can't have the policy behind it, if you can't have law enforcement following through on what has been established, you still get no accountability. All right, now I'm gonna jump up to legislation. Um, this graphic here is about three strikes laws. So the first three strikes law passed in the state of Washington in 96. The year after that, a, a three strikes law was passed in California, and then um, 23 states over the course of the next several years passed three strikes laws. <clears throat> These were laws that said repeat offenders should get extended sentences, and there, were, uh, there was a tie to mandatory minimums so that judges' hands were tied when it came to what they were forced to sentence people. Um, and quickly, there, were, there was evidence of, of egregious moments um, of individuals who ran against these three strikes laws and became incarcerated for life. Um, in California, there was a man who was sentenced to 35 years to life for stealing a slice of pizza, which is petty theft, which is a misdemeanor, but because of the three strikes law was able to be elevated to a felony and he was locked away for the rest of his life. In Washington State, there were two brothers who they um, were, were incarcerated on their third robbery. They had had an attempted robbery and um, second degree robbery. The third one, they robbed a, an espresso bar, um, stole $377. They've been incarcerated now, the two of them, for decades. And part of the reason was um, they were charged with armed assault because they made their fingers guns and stuck them in their pockets and pretended like they were armed. And so for that, they've been incarcerated for decades. And when you think about the United States is the leader of incarceration rates throughout the world, that though we only have 5% of the population in terms of world population, we have 25% of the population that is incarcerated. We have this massive, mass incarceration problem because of laws like three strikes laws um, and the other and the aspects of Gideon that I was mentioning before when it comes to litigation. So, okay, but I, I want to point out specifically for the effective altruism community. Ha, okay. This is really getting into like US tax law wonky stuff, but it is important um, <laughs> that when it comes to tackling criminal justice reform, we can sue, um, so that's litigation, we can have educational programs, but we can only do so through charities that are what's called 501c3s. And if you wanna lobby and you wanna impact um, criminal justice before it becomes law, then you need a 501c4 organization, and I mentioned three strikes because um, California has been estimated that they have paid $4.5 billion um, specifically because of three strikes laws. The state of Washington, where the first three strikes law occurred, um, that campaign to pass the law was $180,000. Half of it was paid by the NRA. So you think about the cost, we think about cost efficiency, right, in terms of impact, where our dollars are most impactful may be in 501c4 organizations, not 501c3 organizations. And the big difference here is for a 501c3, this is what the IRS considers to be a traditional charity. So the organization doesn't get taxed on its revenues. Donors get a tax break for making a gift but there's a very limited purpose in terms of the program. It, it's the, your traditional arts organizations and churches and um, universities and your direct social services. But if you want to do lobbying, 
that's considered outside the scope of a 501c3. That's a 501c4. So that's this um, center section here. If you become a member of the ACLU, you give your $100 and you get your ACLU card, you don't get a tax deduction for that because the ACLU actually is two separate organizations and you've given to the 501c4. If you wanted to make an additional gift to the ACLU Foundation and get a tax deduction, that is amazing. Um, you may do so. And that only supports litigation and public education. So when it comes to the flexibility of being able to change policy, if the way to change policy means you, an organization needs to be flexible and pursue the best tactic in that moment, which could lie outside this tax deductible structure of the 501c3. Okay, it's worth also saying any organization that's for profit, those are the two nonprofit designations, okay? C3 and C4. Any for profit company can also try to change policy, and this happens all the time. Um, companies all the time try to lobby in terms of their favor and not. And I mention this here just because there have been a couple of um, major philanthropy organizations that very deliberately form themselves as LLCs, limited liability corporations, explicitly so they could have the full range of programming in terms of um, how they might have impact. And that's the Chan Zuckerberg initiative and the Open Philanthropy Project is also an LLC. Okay, <clears throat> immigrants' rights. We sued Trump a couple times um, <laughs> that's just funny. So on the seventh day of his presidency, he signed an executive order that banned all refugees and, Muslim, um, and people from seven predominantly Muslim countries. Um, we call those the Muslim ban executive orders. We, uh, the ACLU sued against those where we are right now, and that is, um, it's, there's a few different cases working their way through the courts. <clears throat> My colleague argued um, in front of the Fourth Circuit three weeks ago. Um, the week after that, there was an argument in front of the Ninth Circuit. That was the Hawaii case. Both of them came back and said that this executive order is unconstitutional. A couple days ago, Trump said he wanted the Supreme Court to take a look at it. So that's where we are right now in terms of litigation. Meanwhile, in terms of legislation, um, their states are trying to pass anti-sanctuary city laws. And just like we saw with um, same-sex marriage and with the three strikes law, as soon as it happens in one state, it tends to spread. And that we're trying to get in front of it now so that there are these protections for undocumented immigrants before we have to invest the years and the millions of dollars in litigation. And this last picture um, I wanna show you about public engagement. This is a group of school children in DC. <laughs> and the other um, piece of the ACLU's work is that we give Know Your Rights presentations. So there's a lot of fear right now in the immigration community. And this is um, a group of kids whose parents are undocumented and they came to us and they asked for this information and then they put on these skits pretending like ICE, uh, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is the federal immigration agency. Like ICE had come to the door and was knocking on the door asking for their parents and it was their parents that were in the audience and the adults in their community, and they were there communicating to them, this is how we should act as an immigrant community. This is what our rights are. This is when we have to open the door. This is when it's okay to ignore it. This is when we're allowed to have an attorney. So that kind of public engagement, um, again, goes back to, to the, the hearts and minds piece of what the ACLU does. Okay, I have one other thing and I haven't gotten the one minute um, <clears throat> notice yet, so I'm going to take my chance to do this. Um, this is a harder part, okay. So 
DC, um, it used to be known as the Chocolate City um, because it was predominantly black communities. And it was in those communities um, that because of housing, racist housing laws were compressed into neighborhoods that had poor services and poor education and the highest um, engagement with law enforcement. In other words, they had the highest amounts of injustices. They ended up being the places where the ACLU saw we could do impact litigation or legislation. Meanwhile, the ACLU DC's board was almost all white. And right now, the staff were, uh, of our 10 full-time employees for the ACLU DC, 60% um, of us are white. And I want to explicitly draw this connection between people in the impacted communities, people who are suffering from the injustice um, of the law enforcement community and immigrants, and the decision makers who are affecting the policy. And what I see at the ACLU is we're cognizant of this and we're trying to be very aware that every issue we talk about, there is an intersectionality with race and there's an intersectionality with gender. And that, um, if I may be blunt, I don't yet see in effective altruism that we've had that recognition. <laughs> and if I can be doubly blunt, I have sat in the audience and heard people talk about race and thought, that's not me. That's someone else. I'm clearly not racist. Yet every one of us interacts with these structures that have given us privileges or denied us privileges because of exactly the type of people we are. So part of me working at the ACLU has, being, has been me understanding I am a white woman who is middle class who lives in suburban DC. And actually, that's a really narrow perspective. And when it comes to how we change policy, I need to listen to a lot more people. I need to listen to people who are in the impacted communities people who are brown and who are black, people of color, that this needs to be much more outside of me. And I would just encourage the effective altruism community to do the same. I did not leave time for questions. I'm so sorry. But here's a picture, love and cupcakes for everyone. So. Sorry.